Over the last month, my wife had been acting a little odd. I thought it was cabin fever. She wasn't used to staying in the house so much. At first, she made excuses, saying she needed to go to the shops to buy milk. I told her we had enough. She said she had to get some just in case. When I kept questioning her, she turned her attention to the dog. Taking him for so many walks, he visibly pulled on his lead, wanting to stay in. I told her that it was hard for both of us. That I knew she missed work. To be honest, I don't know how she did it in the first place. Being a forensic scientist, being around all that... Death? I thought a little time away would be good. She said to me once she thought the dead were her best friends. As you could talk as much as you liked, and they never answered back. Then, two weeks ago... She stopped going out. Stopped making excuses. But also stopped speaking to me. When I tried to talk to her over breakfast, she'd be in a faraway land and would only acknowledge me when I called her name several times. Darren, she then said, with that twang that meant she wanted to ask a really big favor. Here it was. This was the reason for the silent treatment. And to be fair, I would have agreed with almost anything she had to say right then if it would bring back my wife, my Sarah. Yeah, I replied, bracing myself. The lab called today. They want me to work on a project. That's wonderful news, I said. I was more than happy for her to go back to work, get her in some sort of routine, so one of us didn't end up killing the other. It's a work from home kind of thing. Oh. She saw my shoulders physically deflate. I tried to placate her. You'd like to be busy again, wouldn't you? Yeah, 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 she said. Her face brightened. That was the first time I realized that she hadn't been washing her hair. I was surprised I hadn't noticed earlier. I was so pleased, though, with her excitement. Well, do I get to know what it is? That's the thing. I need to ask a massive favor. I knew what that meant. She'd only done that once before. She brought home a project, she kept it in the garage, and did her work there. I didn't ask questions. She offered no answers. It's a biggie, she continued. But we will get paid a lot of money. Like, what? Like, how much? I replied, not even thinking about what it was in exchange for. 20,000? Fucking hell. I shouted, tell them yes. You haven't heard what they want. Okay, I said, already thinking about how we could spend the money. We needed a new car, a new kitchen. The bathroom was a state. I forgot about the bed. We needed a new one of those, too. I have to bring home a specimen and monitor it. Right. What on earth type of specimen is rewarded with so much cash? A virus? Hopefully not the virus. We'd been doing so much to stay away from that. It'll be in an airtight container. Someone needs to monitor it, take readings, and report back. Can't do it in the lab. We aren't allowed anyone back in there yet. It's really important. That didn't seem too bad. For how long? Two weeks, tops? Then it can go back. Can I ask what it is? Her face shied away from me, as if expecting the question, but not prepared for the answer. A body? A body? Like, a human? She nodded. Like, dead? She nodded again. We can put it in the spare room. I felt myself heave. We can't do that. No way. No way in hell. She grimaced. We kind of have to, she said, her voice going up at the end. It's already in the garage. I stood up. Well, tell him to take it back. I can't. I've already accepted the money. It's been out of refrigeration for a day now. The container will explode if I don't tend to it. She then got up and opened the bank app. See, the money's already there. It was. I was in stunned silence. You don't have to have anything to do with it. I'll do it all. Even bring it into the house. Why does it need to be in here? I can control the temperature if it's inside. The battery on the unit will die tonight. It needs to be plugged in. I shook my head. And I carried on doing that as she pecked me on the cheek. Thanked me and said she would make it worth my while. All I did was shudder. I tried to distract myself as I heard the front door open. 
Ten minutes later, a dragging sound and Sarah heaving and panting. My husbandly instinct wanted to go help her, though. I couldn't. I, I just couldn't. I Just thinking about it made me shudder again. I was glad our bedroom was upstairs and that thing would be downstairs. An hour later, she came in and said, Well done. Did you wash your hands? She looked at them with puzzlement and sniffed her palms. It's not that bad. Jesus, Sarah, take a shower. She rolled her eyes and disappeared upstairs. I was tense. I don't think I moved from the spot until I heard the shower come on. I had trouble sleeping that night. I kept waking from a repeating dream of me going into the spare room and seeing a corpse lying there decomposing. When I woke up in the morning, Sarah was nowhere to be found, and the smell of cooking bacon wafted into the room. I changed and I went downstairs. I was greeted by my wife cooking in front of the stove. Good morning, she said. I thought you'd like to have some bacon and eggs. Good timing. She was finishing up and putting the still sizzling bacon on a plate. Sunny side up, like you like. I sat down and thought maybe, just maybe I could do two weeks of this. I sunk my fork into the bacon and took a bite. Perfectly cooked. Very good, I said. Thank you very much. I just needed to check on our little friend. She giggled and left the room. And then it came back to me. The fact that there was a dead body in our house and my appetite vanished. Around half an hour later, she returned, seeing me browse my phone. I was trying to take my mind off of it, taking small bites when I could. I've hardly touched your food, she pouted. It's the thing. I'm not used to it like you are. You'd be surprised how easy it gets after a while. Did you wash your hands? Again with this? I think it's the least you can do. God. You'd never make it in my job. I don't want your job. I shouted after her. I could tell she was pissed off. She didn't speak much for the rest of the day, and when she had to tend to our visitor, she didn't even tell me. Only when she returned. Yes, I've washed my hands. Over the next few days, something changed in her. A determined purpose that I'd never seen before. It must be what she was like at work. She spent more and more time in there with it. And I swore I could smell a stench coming from within, though I didn't want to venture to the side of the house. She stopped coming up to bed with me. I'd lie there in silence, hearing noises coming from the room downstairs. It didn't sound like simple monitoring to me. When she came up, she went straight to the end suite, washed her hands for all of two seconds. That was to preempt me, but also to spite me. She was telling me that she didn't want to do it. And if she had to, she'd only perform the ritual and none of the substance. She came to bed without a word and turned out the light. An acid odor seeping out from the covers and making me sick. In the morning, she tended to it. I made a call. I phoned her office. I asked to speak to her manager. Hey, Josh, I don't know if you remember me. I'm Darren, uh, Sarah's husband. Oh, hi, he, he said excitedly. I do remember you. How are you? Uh, well, not great. You know the specimen that you asked Sarah to look after? I use that word as if it were a secret code. Uh-huh. But why did she need to bring it home? Oh, we're on a skeleton staff. He started. I wondered if that was supposed to be a clever pun. She said you had a setup for it, hence the extra money. It's a, it's a bit weird, I replied. Our job's different from yours, I can imagine. Sarah, when she's at work, she, does she get a little distant? He laughed. Yeah, we say she's in a trance. Always talking with the dead. I, I think she really enjoys them more than us. Um. Well, she did mention something like that, I replied, feeling a little relieved for the confirmation. Uh, at least you have that to look forward to. You won't leave her lonely if you go first. I was silent. Sorry, that's uh, <laughs> our, our way of coping. You have to laugh, right? Yeah, I suppose so. Um, could you not tell Sarah I phoned? I don't want her to think I was um, checking up. Yeah, no problem. Speak to you again. 
When I hung up, Sarah was on the threshold of the room with a scowl painted on her face. Who are you talking to? Work, I said, technically, not lying. Oh, are you going back soon? No. Are you trying to get rid of me? It's hard to work when you're around. How about you take the dog for a walk? Now that was a great idea. When we returned, the dog ran into the house and straight to the spare room, sniffing under the door. Jack, get away from there, I said in a whisper. We can't be back here. He didn't move, but continued to sniff. I felt queasy as I approached. Then I heard something. Subtle, but the closer I got, it was obvious sing-song hummy. That of a lullaby. Brahms lullaby, if I wasn't mistaken. Sarah, is that you? With that, the humming stopped. I heard a thunk from inside the room so loud. Jack ran away, his claws skittering on the floor. Then the door unlocked and Sarah poked her head around the frame. What do you want? She snapped impatiently. And with the door open came a sweet smell. That of meat. I took a step back. Jack cowered behind my legs. I'm working here. Go away. The door slammed shut. I didn't see my wife again that day. The next day, no bacon was waiting for me. In fact, we'd run out of milk. The irony. I wondered where she was, but hearing more noises from within the spare room, I knew exactly. I texted her, asking if she wanted anything, and that we were out of milk. Go to the shops, then, was her only reply. I didn't think about it. I picked up my keys and I headed out. Jack scratched at the door, pleading for me to take him, but I couldn't leave him outside the shops. I already wondered how people could do that. I never liked leaving him in the car when I had to fill up for gas. I had a fear I'd turn my back and when I returned he'd be gone. I'm sorry, buddy. Keep your mom company, I said. He responded by cocking his head to one side and giving out a small whine. In the car, the road was quiet. I drove slowly, wanting to stretch the time I spent out of the house. Every mile away from home, I felt the stress fall off my shoulders, making me wonder if it was a good idea to even turn back at all. I shopped, sat back in the car, holding my keys near the ignition, telling myself I could have another five minutes before I needed to head back. This game of chicken I was having was interrupted by my phone, an impatient buzzing in my pocket. It was Josh. I was relieved. He refused to stay where I was, if only for a few minutes. Hey, long time no speak, I said, trying to be funny, though it fell on deaf ears. Darren, I'm sorry to be so abrupt, but we have a problem. Uh, what kind of problem? His voice was hushed, as if trying to conceal the conversation from potential eavesdroppers. You said your wife brought home a specimen? Yeah, I did, I shuddered. And it's in the house. Oh, uh, yeah, it is. Hideous thing. Have you seen it? God, uh, no. No, I, I don't want to go anywhere near it. The problem, Darren, it, it's still here. What do you mean? The specimen Sarah was to take home is still in refrigeration. I only found it by accident. I noticed when I went in to retrieve something else. I, I swear to you, that thing is in our house. I, I can smell it. Smell? Christ, I knew it. I didn't want to believe it at first. What the hell are you talking about? The specimen. The one Sarah was to receive in, in a box the size of a Coke can. It's still here. If something much bigger is missing. I'm sorry, I... I don't, I don't understand something. My wife said she needed to monitor a corpse. That's no corpse. It's not alive in the strictest sense of the word. But it's certainly not a corpse. Or dead. Where are you right now? I'm in the Tesco car park. Stay where you are. I need to make a call and I will sort this out. I promise. I hung up without saying goodbye. I sat in stunned silence. Feeling a sense of dread grow, I absentmindedly rummaged around in my groceries, trying to distract myself with questions that I couldn't answer, and didn't want to know, swirling around my head. 
My hand stopped in a dog treat. Jack. I plunged my key into the ignition and squealed out of the car park, speeding along the small country roads. If anything happens to him, I swear, I said to myself, trailing off, not wanting to play those outcomes through my head. I got out of the car, ran 30 yards to the front of the house, and unlocked the door. Jack! I shouted into the otherwise silent house. Where are you, buddy? Nothing. A knot developed in my stomach and sent a searing shot of white panic up my spine. Jack? Sarah? Nothing. From where I stood, I hadn't moved since I had entered the house. I saw the door to the spare room hanging open. Stop shouting, Darren! I heard muffled from within. I took my time approaching, a conflict brewing inside me, wanting to know why the door was open and what Sarah was doing, and... I feared to get as far away from this place as I could. Sarah? I said again, trying to sound calm, not upset, not angry, not scared. Then a soft hum, a children's lullaby. I rounded the door to see my wife, or at least that's what I remembered of her. She sat on the floor, her hair now more disheveled and unkempt than it had been before. She rocked back and forth, something laying over her lap and cradled in her arms. Then a wave of stench hit me, a lukewarm barrage of rotten meat and foulness that made me take a turn and take a breath. I broke out into a coughing fit. Isn't he lovely? She said, and I didn't want to turn around and see the abomination I only glimpsed. He was a little grumpy, so I'm trying to get him to go back to sleep. She sang softly, and I gradually returned my gaze, breathing through my mouth as much as possible. That's a good boy, she said. A humanoid form lay limp, its skin a mottled purple, veins spidered its surface as if it... If I wasn't mistaken, I swear I could see a liquid pump below in a staccato flush. What is that thing? I asked, my voice quivering with fright. Her face was covered by the bird's nest hair she failed to wash. She bucked her chin and her demented gaze locked with mine. So many red vessels decorated the whites of her eyes. Her skin gray and sweaty, but her grin that betrayed how delightfully happy she was. I did it, she said, with a useful exuberance that was lost in her demeanor. I really did. Sarah, put it down and come outside, I said, panicked, trying my best not to think about the thing that lay lovingly in my wife's arms. Lying there, almost cuddling her back, lying there with crooked arms and legs, as if all the bones had been snapped and never healed. She shook her head and went back to singing. I turned my head again and tried to breathe in the fresh air from the hallway, and now it was tainted. I couldn't escape the smell. My thoughts turned back to my dog. Where's Jack? I said with a weak purpose that left my mouth as a whisper. Hmm? She said, not taking her eyes off the hermunculus. Where's Jack? I demanded, this time with venom. I wanted to heave. The stench was now a permanent resident in my nasal passages. Quiet! She snapped. I heard a groan in the labored, heavy breathing of the asthmatic. Through gritted teeth, she whispered, You woke him! It was my turn to snap. I didn't care anymore. I wanted my dog. A sense of self-preservation disappeared. Where's Jack, goddammit? Sarah never spoke. She didn't need to. I didn't see it move, and as soon as the words left my mouth, it was standing in front of me, sniffing and wheezing. Honey, don't hurt him. He means you no harm, Sarah said, trying to soothe the thing. Pitch black eyes darted inches away from my face. Its jaw chittered, its tongue slipped out momentarily between gasps. 
Its joints crunched and creaked as it moved its arms, sending those purple blotched hands searching around my body. Up close, the odor was worse. It was sweeter. Sing him a lullaby. Tell him you love him. Go to sleep and good night, I said quietly, his head cocked to one side. Just like Jack did. And a smile burst onto his lips. Carry on, Sarah said, trying to encourage me. I, I, I don't know any more of the words, I replied. My lips now began to quake. Just hum. So I did. Its eyes began to grow heavy. And finally shut. Sarah crept up behind it, putting her arms around its midriff, and calmly brought him to the floor. I hadn't realized I'd been holding my breath. Good evening. Mm -hmm. She sang softly. A drop of sweat made its way onto my eye, stinging it briefly. There was a knock at the door. Who's that? Sarah said. We're not expecting anyone. No one's allowed here because of the lockdown. She continued to rock. I spoke to Josh, I said. What? And the thing woke, this time sitting upright to attention, like it was protecting its mother. He said, you got sent the wrong specimen. No, he's mine. He was always supposed to be. The thing let out a growl in agreement. Okay, okay I'm, I'm, I'm going to let them in, okay? Don't you dare! I have to. I expected her or it to follow me, but they didn't. I opened the door to see two men carrying small guns with needles that extended. I assumed they were tranquilizers. At the end of the front yard, Josh stood and slowly made his way towards me. The men disappeared into the house in silence. Hey, I'm really sorry you're involved in this. We'll be discreet, he said, sounding sincere. Is this my wife's fault? We don't know yet. Stay outside where it's safe. My dog, he's missing. He hung his head, placing his hands on my shoulders. I'm so sorry. Outside, minutes seemed like hours. Then the stench returned. I could feel its presence. It was behind me. I, I didn't turn. I didn't want to look at it again. I, I stood still, trying not to move. Then a bark... Then another, and then the smell dissipated. There in the yard near the bushes was Jack. How did you get out here? I asked, kneeling down next to him and ruffling his fur. From there I could see the side of the house, the open window and the curtains that blew outside. Run, my love. I heard my wife shout. Run! She wasn't talking to me. They took the money back wasn't my wife's fault. I, I wish I could take solace in that. They, they haven't told me anything more. I've seen nothing about this on the news. They promised me that they'd pay me for my wife's mental health care. They promised me that they will pay her for as long as it takes to get her right again. See, my wife's been acting a little odd. She doesn't speak anymore. She only eat if I feed her. She, she does nothing in the day except, except stare longingly. I think she's in mourning. She didn't sleep for the first few nights. I was scared for her. And I, I sung to her a, a certain lullaby. And now she sleeps soundly. It's the first step in her recovery. I just... I just hope it's not... The last. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or watching tonight, or listening to tonight's podcast, because it's also a podcast on Spotify, or on Apple, or on Google, or anywhere else you can listen to the podcast. 
If you've all been curious about what I look like and not just what I sound like, then you might be getting your chance to be able to see that. On Indiegogo right now, there is a project called Giggles Indie Horror Movie. The Giggles Indie Horror Movie is something that's spearheaded by Madame Macabre, and I'm sure you're all aware of her. It's a film that I've been asked to play one of the major leads in, and I'm super excited about it, so I hope that all of you are excited about it as well. You can check out the trailer there on the Indiegogo page, as well as a lot of the different effects and makeup that they're working on for this clown-themed horror film. And lastly, as always, I want to remind you guys, if you ever want to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And I really appreciate any time you guys can support the show, because honestly, I love you guys. <laughs> You're all awesome. So. A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Haha ha Saha, Ken Lenda Higuchi, Mazakin, Champinsky, The Red Oak Shield Virus, G Weevil 3, Diana Krause, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Last Blade Song, Caleb Dougal, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Bobby Karen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Barbara Maceo, Thomas Burgett, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Bad Honey, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Shadow Morningstar, Mad Marshtomp, Mr. Thud, Patrick Schoolmeister, Z Kearley, Wolfie Nums, Rafael Rodriguez, WR Axis, Prozac and Pancakes, Mike Bullock, Acid System, Lauren, Brian Arse, and Rumble Fox. And also a huge thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. You guys, as always, are the real MVPs, and I appreciate you more than I can possibly say. So thank you guys, thank you all for listening. And sweet dreams. <laughs>